Hey, if you're visiting with us, I know it's a weird note to start on, but it's, it's good to have you with us this morning. Uh, we started a sermon series three weeks ago, which kind of means you have no idea what I said three weeks ago, because it's hard enough to remember a lesson from last week, let alone three weeks. But we started a series called This Is Us, and we were aiming at trying to figure out as the Choctaw Church of Christ, who are we? Who are we? What are we all about? And our first week a few weeks ago, we took a step back and said, before we discuss who we are and what we're all about, we need to remember why there even is in us. And we talked about how we are a diverse group of people who have come from all over to this place because we've learned a life-changing truth that we were guilty of God's death, that our sin put Him on the cross. We learned that we were witnesses to His resurrection, to the power He has over death. And because of that, we all responded to His call. We gave our lives to Him. We committed to Him. We immersed ourselves in Him. And now we are more than just a people who meet on Sunday morning, but we're a kingdom. We're a movement. We're a body of people. And we're a family. And we're going to talk about what we are all about as the church, simplifying it down into three or four big picture ideas. And this morning, before we get into it, I want to talk to you about this guy for a second. Now, some of you are already groaning by the logo on his shirt or his hat. Give me a moment. I grew up 10 minutes or so from the University of Oklahoma's campus. And as someone who played sports my entire life, uh, and it was a big part of my childhood, you can imagine who I'm a fan of when it comes to sports. I try to go to every football game and basketball game at Oklahoma that I can. I watch all the games on TV. I'm one of those weird fans who even keeps up with concepts like recruiting. I'm one of those guys, I know. Um, I, in college sports, there's a direct correlation between the amount of success you have and the amount of talent you have. And so I like to see, well, how are they recruiting? I find that concept interesting, don't you? That grown men around the country are fighting over teenagers. <laughs> you ever thought about that? That you have grown men, that their job, their success depends upon 16 and 17 year olds. I don't know if there's another job like that. There, there really isn't. And it's interesting in recruiting. Uh, it's, it's difficult to recruit a teenager. Uh, for those of you who remember how you were when you were a teenager, if you work with teenagers uh, or if you have teenagers, you know it's difficult to have a kid make a decision. It's even harder to get a kid to make a life-changing decision. And so all these grown men are trying to get these talented young individuals to come play. But they have family in their ear. They have their friends in their ear. They're concerned about their name, their image, their likeness, the amount of money that they might be compensated to play at this university. And I find something that Brent Venables does when he recruits talented kids very interesting. When he offers a kid a scholarship to play football at the University of Oklahoma, when they come take a visit, he gives them a poker chip. And inscribed on the poker chip are three words, I'm all in. And he tells them this, I want you to enjoy recruiting. I want you to enjoy the process. Talk to all the coaches, visit all the schools you can, enjoy the process. And if you want to play here, that's great. But do not commit here until you are really all in. So go enjoy the visits. Go talk to the coaches. Ask a lot of questions. But when you're ready and you commit, you're committed. I don't know how well you can see this picture. Um, I just put it up there so maybe you can see the poker chip. But this was a FaceTime call he had with a recruit last year when he called him to say, Coach, I'm committed. And I share that with you because... I think it illustrates a lot of us, doesn't it? When you and I were immersed into Jesus, we might have done that for a lot of motivations. I received something from God. There is eternal life. There is salvation. I maybe was looking forward to making that decision because of I didn't want to receive what would have come to me. But do we understand and realize that when we are immersed into Jesus, we have made an all-in decision? I'm not banking on anything else. I'm putting everything on Jesus. I'm going all in on Him. And because of our all-in commitment to Jesus, we should be all in on a few specific areas as a church. What Christian read to us a moment ago so well tells us this. We are all in. 
Our verse this morning that we read out loud together talked about how they were added to the church when they were saved. And then the next picture we have of this church is they're all in. They're all in doing specific things together. And we read of it in verse 42. Because we're taking all of our points of who we are in this series out of this passage. But I want you to notice the first four words. And they devoted themselves. I think the idea there is they were all in. They were fully committed to becoming who God wanted them to be. They were fully committed, invested, devoted in being the church God wanted them to be. And this morning, what we're talking about is that first thing on the list, the apostles' teaching. Not everything in this series comes from this verse. We're not doing each one of these each week. Fellowship, we'll talk about that in a later week. The breaking of bread, we did that earlier this morning with the communion. There's prayers. We're not necessarily going to have lessons on that in this series. But I wanted to spend some time talking about the apostles' teaching because we are all in on the apostles' teaching. That's what I want us to understand this morning. As a church, we should be all about the Word of God. Without it, we are essentially nothing. Without God and without His Word, we are nothing. So we're all in on the Apostles' teaching. And this morning what I would like to do is just explain what what is that exactly. But more importantly, what does that mean for us as a body of people? Uh, We're not going to spend actually our time in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible and you want to follow along with the verses on the screen, you can turn to 1 Timothy. And we'll be there in a couple moments. But I first wanted to explain what exactly is the Apostles' teaching. If you're like myself, you might look at that and say, why does it say they were devoted to their teaching? Well, there could be a few reasons for that. One being, they're the ones who are physically teaching them in that moment. Remember what we talked about a few weeks ago. They heard the gospel from the Apostles. They're the ones who stood up in the middle of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and they preached through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they heard the message from the apostles, these Christians did. They responded to them, and they're all still in Jerusalem. They don't have a Bible to turn to like we do. They don't have the New Testament. So the teaching they needed to receive to grow, the apostles did it right then and there. But what exactly is the apostles' teaching? Could it be more than that? The apostles' teaching are the words of Jesus. In our world today, sometimes you get this idea, or people ask this question of, Is the Apostles' teaching different than the teaching of Jesus? Is the Apostles' teaching like a subset of teaching or a lesser lesser important teaching than Jesus? And I want to explain through some verses in the Bible that answer. And John chapter 14 and verse 10 said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does His work. I just want you to notice there, That Jesus spoke His words not on His simply own authority, but the Father's authority. They weren't only His words. But then notice what He said a little later in this chapter in verses 25 and 26 of John 14. Jesus would say these things, speaking to the apostles, I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Notice, that the apostles were going to speak the words Jesus spoke to them. They would receive the Spirit so they could remember all the things Jesus told them. Here's the point. The apostles' words are the words of Jesus. Some try to make them lesser or different, but that's not the case. The words we read of in the New Testament, they are Jesus' words. There's not a battle going on. They're simply recalling what the Spirit is telling them to share. And so when you think of, we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, what does that mean? Well, it's the Word of God. It's the words of Jesus. It's the will God has given to us through His Scripture. And so just simply this morning, I want to say the apostles' teaching that we're devoted to, that means, that means the words of Jesus. They are the same. But then a second point to understand about the apostles' teaching that I think might be good to know is that the apostles' teaching is sound doctrine. And that's where I want to get into 1 Timothy, if you have your Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, Paul is writing to a young preacher. He's a mentor to this preacher named Timothy. And Paul is giving him instructions, and he talks a lot about teaching. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, it says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. 
understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, and he goes on and on. But I want you to notice this phrase. Whatever else is contrary to what? Sound doctrine. I have never used the word doctrine talking with someone in a normal conversation, typically. Maybe preachers, because preachers have a tendency to use Bible words. But we don't use that. What is doctrine? Doctrine simply means teaching. When you read in your Bible the word doctrine, you can replace it with teaching. They are the same thing. They are interchangeable. Sound teaching. Well, we know the word sound, but that doesn't make sense with what we read. The word sound simply means healthy. We are talking about healthy teaching. The apostles' teaching, or their doctrine, is healthy teaching. And so what he's saying here, he's talking about a people who are living contrary to sound teaching, to the gospel that God had given the apostles. You see this theme in, uh, earlier in the chapter in verse 3 of 1 Timothy. He told Timothy, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Notice this phrase. Not to teach what? Any different doctrine. Well, what doctrine are you talking about? He's talking about teaching that is contrary to healthy teaching. Teaching that is contrary to the message God had, been, had delivered the church through the apostles and prophets. That's what he's speaking about. And so he said, hey, Timothy, there are certain individuals amongst your midst that I have instructed, that I have rebuked, that I have reproved with patience and teaching, and they are unwilling to change and adhere to the truth. You need to charge them to teach the healthy teaching and not teach anything differently. That was Timothy's mission. That's what uh, he urges Timothy to do here. Uh, we continue on. Notice what he emphasizes to Timothy at the end of 1 Timothy. He says, Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus and the teaching that accords with godliness, he would go on to say who they are. We'll go back to that verse in a moment. But notice these phrases again. Teach and urge what? These things. What's he talking about? Well, it's the healthy teaching he's been giving him in the letter. It's the healthy teaching he's been emphasizing. Teach and urge this teaching. Notice this phrase again. You see the theme here? If anyone teaches what? A different doctrine. Teaching that is not in line or in unity with the teaching that we have received from God himself. He says, don't teach that. Don't, don't get involved in that. You stick to the healthy teaching. And then also, here's what you do with those who refuse, even though you've corrected, even though you've patiently bore up with them and tried to help them, here's what happens if they're unwilling to change. I, I want to pause real quick. And there's a few important truths that we can learn about healthy teaching that we talk about with the apostles' teaching. First, just notice there is a standard of teaching that God has for His people. That might seem obvious to some, but it's not to everybody. There is a standard. We aren't a people who make it up as we go. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Just, hey, let's just figure this out so we go. No, it wouldn't be nice, actually. We'd be a mess. We're already a mess anyway, but we'd be even more of a mess. We aren't a people who follow our individual feelings on every matter. We're not a people who say, well, what do we think? Or what do we, how do we feel about this? And that's what we're going to do. That's not how this goes in the church. That's not the teaching he wants us to be a part of. We aren't a people who get together and choose our own standards. The church is all about following the teaching that was delivered to us. Paul wrote to Timothy, and his purpose statement is in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and he says, I write that you may know how to behave in the household of God. I write that you may know there is a standard of behavior for the church. There is a standard the church is to adhere to. And I, we need to understand that about healthy teaching. There is a standard. Secondly, this might seem obvious again to some, but it's worth noting. Teaching can be correct or it can be incorrect. Teaching can be true, but it can also be false. The New Testament spends a substantial amount of time addressing false teaching, which simply means wrong teaching, not, 
not saying that the people who had the wrong teaching necessarily had bad motives. They might have just misunderstood or not had been informed yet. We see that at times. But also it spends maybe even more time addressing false teachers, those with impure motives who twist the Bible, twist God's word for their own selfish gain and greed. And God says a lot about those individuals. Here's one verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-3. through 3, Paul told Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach what? The Word. Sound teaching. What's been given to us. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. When, when God's Word is popular and everyone's going to agree with it, preach it. When people are going to hate it and disagree with it, guess what? Preach it. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. The problem of false teachers and false teaching was relevant in the first century and it hasn't gone anywhere. Do you and I realize that we have more teaching accessible to us than anyone else in human history. Have you ever thought about that? There's no one in human history who has more teaching available to them than us right now in this moment. Imagine what it will be like in 50 years. That is a blessing in many ways. The sound, healthy teaching of Jesus can be spread to so many people. It's accessible to all. That's wonderful. That also means, though, there is more false teaching accessible to everyone than any time before in human history. Do you see the problem or maybe the dilemma we have? We sometimes think false teaching comes from people who look like me, that sounds bad, who stand behind a pulpit on a stage in church buildings. And sometimes that's the case. But false teaching is everywhere. False teaching are in the videos we watch on YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok. False teaching is in the books we read. False teaching is in our movies and television shows. False teaching happens everywhere. And Satan is this perfect little liar that he just whispers it into everything around us. That problem is still true today. And what that means is we need to be reminded there are teachings that are healthy, good. There's also teachings that are not. We need to be careful about what we take in. Another truth we see about healthy teaching Healthy teaching always agrees with the words of Jesus Christ and produces healthy Christians. Always. If we ever need to determine, is this teaching healthy? Is it good? Is it from God? Well, we can say, what did God say? Let's find it in His Word. Is there a clear command in Scripture about this? Do we see this lived out in Jesus' life? Does it match what we read of Jesus? And we can determine, yes, this teaching is of God or it's healthy, or this teaching is not. We didn't read this second part of this verse when he says, if anyone uh, teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, here's what he says about those people. He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Unhealthy teaching creates unhealthy people. And we can see that. Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. Sometimes you can know a teaching is bad by its fruits. And here he's talking about these false teachers who are spreading a false message. He says, look at the lives they are creating. Look at the lives they live. This is their condition. And so this morning, those are a couple truths about false teaching or the apostles teaching, I should say. It's the words of Jesus and it is sound doctrine. It is healthy teaching. And I wanted to clarify because we're saying, hey, as a church, we're devoted to the apostles' teaching. We're devoted to the sound words we see in Scripture. But what in the world does that mean for us as a people? I have three little applications I think that means for you and I. Pretty short, might seem simple, but usually it's the short and the simple things that are incredibly important, right? So here it, here it goes. Here's what that means for you and I. Number one, we must emphasize reading 
studying and teaching the Word of God. I know you hear that message some, or a lot, but it applies in this lesson. As a church, reading, discussing, teaching, preaching, it shouldn't be the only thing we are about, but it should be a major part of who we are. Without the words of God, we don't know who we should become. Without the words of God, we really can't know God's will for us. And if God has given to us His word and will to know Him, if, it's, if He's given it to us to guide us as a church and as an individual, we should spend a substantial amount of time in it together. The early church was eager and excited to hear the message of Jesus. They were eager to sit at the feet of teachers and hear God's word. And we need a similar attitude. Listen, I know people love short sermons. Many of you are saying, I would love a short sermon right now. I want to respect your time when I'm up here speaking. But I also, and I understand that not every subject and lesson needs to be a long, long lesson. But think about this for a moment. If doctors say that you need 20 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a day, which goes out to oh, what, 140 minutes a week of exercise to be healthy, and they say beyond that you really should add resistance training twice a week, and if you could spend five hours, that would be even better a week exercising. If they say that is what we need to be healthy physically, why do we think 20 minutes of God's Word is going to make us healthy spiritually? Why do we think maybe 40 minutes together a week is what's going to be healthy for us? We need to spend time in God's Word together. This is the mode that God created to share His message with people, to convict us and to move us and to encourage us. We should spend time emphasizing it. We should read it. He told Timothy, do not, do not neglect the public reading of Scripture. How often do we just stand up and read? How often you just sat there, let's read a chapter, let's read a book. Do we emphasize studying it? Let's just get together and talk about it. Formal, informal, let's teach and preach. Let's spend time hearing the Word of God together. We should emphasize it. If the early church did that, the church we're trying to be like did that, then we need to be that too. So I think we do somewhat of a pretty good job emphasizing preaching and teaching in this church. But it can always grow with our reading and our studying. But that's why we emphasize this is who God wants us to be. Secondly, this morning, if we're a church devoted to the apostles' teaching, that means we must ask a lot of questions. Later in the book of Acts, we read about a people called the Bereans. And it says they were noble-minded because they searched the Scriptures daily to see if the words Paul told them were true. They were eager to receive the words, but notice they asked a lot of questions. It wasn't like they got it and said, yep, that's just true. They asked questions. They asked questions because they wanted to confirm the message was true. They asked questions to see whether it was right or wrong. They asked questions because they were sincerely interested in what God had to say and what His will is. We should ask a lot of questions. We ask because we care. We ask because we know we don't always get it right. I'm afraid some members of the church, and even myself at times, have an attitude of everyone else has it wrong but me. Does that ever scare you? If you have that attitude, should that scare us sometimes? I hope that doesn't describe us. The Bible speaks of a group of people in the Gospels who thought they had it all figured out, who thought they knew it all, and people thought they knew the law super well, and Jesus says, you're missing a lot. You're lacking in some areas. You don't understand or you don't apply it well. Understand this morning, the Bible is perfect. We have the perfect Word of God. But that doesn't mean we are perfect. The Bible is perfect. It doesn't mean our knowledge or understanding or our application of it is perfect. So we ask a lot of questions because we're humble. I might not know it all. I might have this wrong. I'm willing to look at it. I'm willing to ask questions. I'm willing to dig deep. And so as a church, if we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, we should ask a lot of questions. And we should dig to find truth. And we always go back to God's Word to find that truth. But then lastly, as a church, if we are devoted to the apostles' teaching, we must be willing to change when we don't match up. Being devoted... 
to God's Word is more than just being just the amount of time you spend in God's Word. It's more than just emphasizing it from a pulpit when you meet together. If, if I spend, personally, if I spend hours in my Bible, but I'm not willing to change to match what I read, can I really say I'm committed to the words of God? No, I just talk a lot. <laughs> or I read a lot. But I, how can I really say I'm committed to it if I'm not willing to change? Church, we need to emphasize the Bible, but if we ever come across truth and we realize we don't match it, if we're committed to God's Word, we should be willing to change. See, this is why we have to be humble, isn't it? Because if we're not humble, we'll never change to match God's Word. We'll think we'll have it all right, we got it all figured out, we're good. We apply it perfectly, we're great. we got to ask questions, but we have to be humble enough to say, I might be wrong and I'm willing to change if I see I'm wrong. Now, we're not going to be perfect, church. We know that. But it might be that we are unwilling to change at times, and that's a different problem. We are a people who are devoted to the apostles' teaching. So we should emphasize the Word of God, we should ask a lot of questions, and we should be willing to change if we don't match up. So let's do that. Let's emphasize Scripture as a church family. Let's ask a lot of questions, and let's keep an attitude of humility. And remember, we might not always match what we need to be, but we're willing to work on it. In the weeks to come, we will talk about other subjects that we need to be all in on. But I want you to remember that we need to be all in on them. Hey, this is me. I'm committed. This is all of us. Us as individuals, us as a body, us as a leadership, everything. This is who we are. This is what we're all about. And it starts with being committed to the Word of God. I find it interesting that in this whole list of the things they did and who they were, this is first. And it might be because... If you're not committed to God's Word, you probably won't become everything God wants you to be. In fact, you won't. And so let's be devoted to the Word of God. This morning, uh, we're talking about being who we, are, who we are and being all in on the teaching. You can't be that unless you're all in on Jesus first. And this morning, if you haven't committed your life to Jesus, if you haven't put everything of who you are and brought it to the middle of the table and said, God, I'm betting my life on you. I'm willing to put everything of who I am in your hands. I'm willing to follow wherever you lead me, wherever your word takes me. Do you want to do that this morning? Do you want to become a part of us? Not because we're something special in our own right, but because we're in, we're in a God who is incredibly special. Do you need to make that decision this morning? Or is there something going on in your life you need to repent of, you want to ask for prayers for? Maybe you're convicted of something in your life and you say, I just want some help and some encouragement. If you have a need this morning, won't you be all in on Jesus with us together while we stand and while we sing?